a lot of this stuff has just been sitting on the ground for a long time, so who knows what we're gonna find yeah. inside it. Hi, I'm Danner. I'm a computer engineering student from Huntsville, Alabama. When I was a kid, my family built this shed in the hills of Southern Tennessee. It sat dormant for nearly 20 years and began to deteriorate. I'm currently on a mission to restore the shed and convert it into an amazing tiny house. With the help of my dad, I'm learning the basics of construction, restoring the land, and documenting our story. This is Abandoned Shed to Tiny House. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the channel. It is a beautiful morning here in Southern Tennessee. It's been actually really hot this last week, so we are hoping for a beautiful day. Yesterday it was a little less hot, and so hopefully we'll have a great day today. Over the course of this project, we've really been interested in reusing stuff from the land. Our neighbors have a barn with a bunch of old stuff, old lights, all kinds of stuff that we want to reuse for this project. And another thing we've slowly been inching towards is the idea of using some of the wood on our property as part of this project. I think it all started with the idea of just doing a couple things, but now we're actually thinking about doing some siding and maybe flooring and walls. And there's just so many things that uh, we could be using all this wood that we have on our property. We have a ton of hardwood around here. We have black walnut, we have cherry, we have tulip poplar, this Tennessee state tree. And all of this so far has just really been a a big learning experience. Just cutting down trees alone is terrifying. We've had to have a ton of help with getting our trees down. Another big challenge is just moving the logs around. So luckily we found out our tractor is able to move the logs to where we need to get them to. And the next big thing, of course, is gonna be sawing all these logs. Both me and my dad are very new to saw sawmills. I've actually never even operated or seen a sawmill. So today we are going to be dipping our toes in the water and seeing what it's like to use a sawmill. A couple of videos ago we actually mentioned that we were going to be doing this and asked if there was anyone in the area that'd be willing to help. And our friend Alan from Logs to Lumber Mobile Sawmill has a awesome mobile sawmill. He brings it to you and we are just going to get to see what it's all about. So let's go ahead and meet up with Alan and start learning about this. All right, Alan, thank you for coming out. Nice thank to meet you. you. I'm looking forward to doing this with you today. So me and dad have never touched a sawmill before, mm. so we're really excited about learning how all this works. Mm. How did you get into doing sawmill stuff? Well, I have about 220 acres of farmland and, and forest down in south, uh, south of Huntsville. And every time the wind blew, I have a tree fall down. So I tried to find somebody to come out and do some portable sawmill work for me, and I couldn't find anybody. So I wound up buying my own sawmill. And since I couldn't find anybody, I figured others might need the service too. So I started offering it to the public. Helps me make the payments on the sawmill. Yeah, and that's actually kind of the situation we're in. The majority of the trees that we're looking at today are ones that have just naturally fallen or just needed to go. So um, we've also been kind of looking into sawmills and wanted to figure out more about them. And then you reached out to us in the comments and now here we are. All right, so let's look at what you got. Yeah, let's go check it out. All right, so these are our most recent tree that have fallen. These are some two different tulip poplar trees. We had to cut these down because they were kind of the way of the electrical over there. What we hope to use these for is siding. We really want to use tulip poplar for siding. When I look at this, I just have no idea how much lumber is really in this. Uh, it's probably about 300 board feet coming out of these trees. You know, quite a bit of one by material for siding. What dimensions are you looking for, 12 I think, inch? I think we wanna do, yeah, one by 12. So we're gonna be doing uh, board and batten siding. So uh, we wanna do some one by 12s and then we also wanna figure out where battens come from too. Yeah, so what I would probably do in that case is cut some two inch thick uh, slabs across the center and then slice that two inch thick slabs into one inch strips. Okay. So that you can have the you know, two inch wide batten to cover the seam of your siding. You're also going to, I mean, you need to plan on where you're going to stack the lumber to dry it. And it really shouldn't be out in bright sunshine. Okay, so this is a, 
a shady area back here. Do you think something like this might be good for storing? Yes, as long as you can level the uh, area so that you can lay the boards out flat. So whatever contour the ground is, that's the contour that the boards are gonna take. So you need to make sure that it's level. Then you can build it up and then cover it and keep it in the shade here so that it uh, dries without getting too hot. Now one of the things you don't want to happen is the wood to dry too fast. As you cut wood, it's going to begin to shrink as the water leaves the, the, the fibers. And if it dries too fast, you're going to get uneven uh, shrinkage. So you're going to either get cups or bows or twists or the ends of the boards are going to crack. So that's why you want to, to build your drying stack in the shade so that you get good airflow, but you don't have too much sunlight to heat up the wood. When you construct your drying stack, you need to make sure you keep about three quarters of an inch air gap between every board, both side to side and top to bottom. So you need to separate each layer with stickers. And, and what I use are generally one by twos so they're about three quarters of an inch thick. So every 16 inches, you put down a, a sticker and then you put a layer of wood on top of that, a layer of boards, and then you keep building up your stack until you get it uh, four feet or so high and then you weight that down to make sure that the boards don't bow and let it dry. It's going to take about a year for a one inch board to dry. We probably won't even be done by then anyway. <laughs> And Dad, you said something about putting the uh, the siding up when it was still wet. Yeah, we, so can, it... we can put siding up green. Yeah, uh, you know, any, any project that you do outside, you don't have to worry too much about drying the lumber. You know, for example, if you're doing siding, uh, that's the purpose of the board and batten siding is that you put two boards up and they might shrink when they uh, are begin to dry and they'll separate. But that's what the batten down the middle does. You cover the crack with another board, so when these two shrink and separate, you don't see the crack. So it actually had a real purpose before it became a trendy thing. Yes, and if you're building an outdoor project, you can use green as long as you uh, consider the shrinkage. If you're going to take the wood inside and build furniture, for example, you need to bring the moisture content down to what would be in a uh, conditioned environment, which is about 8% moisture content. So out here in your drying stack, you're going to get down to about 12% moisture content. That extra 4% you need to take out either by letting it sit in a conditioned air space for some length of time or put it in a kiln. And that'll bring it down from the 12% that you get from ambient drying to uh, the moisture content required to build an indoor project. And then other than the speed that kilns dry wood, what are the other benefits of using a kiln? Uh, of course, the, the first purpose of the kiln is to dry the wood. And if you're using a commercial kiln or a solar kiln, you're looking at anywhere from a week to three months to dry green wood to 8% uh, humidity. But another important function of the kiln is to sterilize the wood. So what any piece of wood might have insects in it. They may have laid insect eggs. You may have fungus or anything like that in the wood. So when you finish your drying process, you always raise the temperature of the kiln up to at least 130 degrees and keep it there for eight hours to 24 hours to make sure that you raise the, the core temperature of the lumber to that 130 degrees and that will kill all the insects and kill the fungus. The worst thing you can do is to build a piece of furniture and after you deliver it to your customer you see an insect hole oh. come out you know put sawdust on the floor and that has happened. Wow. Yeah, we definitely don't want that happening. And a lot of this stuff has just been sitting on the ground for a long time, so who knows what we're gonna find yeah. inside it. And poplar is really bad about having post beetles in it. So yep. uh, you, that's what you wanna kill when you sterilize your wood. All right, well, let's just go ahead and go over here and check out some of the other stuff we got. So this first one is a fallen walnut that we found down by our spring. 
And we were originally thinking about doing this with a chainsaw mill, but um, we just decided to drag it up here and just do it on the real deal. So yeah. it's, it's very, it's beginning to decay, but there should still be some good wood down in the heart. The productivity that you get or the, the yield you get out of a log is going to be driven by the narrow end. So in this case, uh, this log is about 12 inches on the narrow end, so everything that's more than 12 inches going up that way will be lost in waste. So in general, if you have logs that taper really rapidly, you may want to cut them a little bit further up and sacrifice what you have at the end. You can get more productivity or more yield out of two eight-foot logs than you can one 16-foot log. Questionable what you're going to get out of it, but you need to think about what you want to do with it. Are we getting one buys or one and a half? If you're building furniture, for example, you want to start with at least one and a half inch or one and a quarter inch, and you're just not going to get very much of that out of this log. And then we also have the cherry that we cut down in the video, so I'm really excited to see what's going to come out of this. What, what are you thinking on this? I think this top part's going to yield some nice looking wood. It'd be interesting to see what is going to be underneath those knots. Might have some good figure in that area. So we're hoping with this pine that we can get some posts to put under our beam that we made uh, going from our living room to our kitchen. We're thinking maybe 10 inches. And right now you're sitting at about 13 inches in diameter and you're going to lose an inch and a half to two inches on all four sides when I square it. So it's going to be difficult to get a 10 inch wide board out of that log. But we'll cut it as thin as we can. And the question would be, how clean do you want it? Is having a little bit of wane or the bark on the edge okay? That, might add, that might add, add a little, a little bit character. Of, might add a little bit of rusticness yeah. to your cabin. That, yeah, so that one's going to be real close to being able to get a 10 incher out of, but uh, we'll do what we can to get that. All right, well, I think we should start on this walnut. This one's probably going to have some bug holes in it. We don't really know what we're going to get, but I think that one will be a cool one to start on. All right, sounds good. We'll set up right over in this area, and we'll use uh, cant hooks to roll the logs up onto the mill. Let's do it. Okay, I thought I would explain a little bit about the mill. This is a wooden miser LT40 super hydraulic. It's got the simple set uh, controls. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. We just walk around the mill a little bit. This is the mill head. It's a bandsaw mill. It has a 28 inch maximum cut between the, the guides. So the largest cut I can make is 28 inches. The maximum height that it will raise above the bed is 36 inches. So I can start with a log as large as 36 inches and I would have to take a cut across the top and then rotate the log and take another cut across the top and rotate the log to be able to get it inside this uh, length. The other constraint I have is once you square up an edge you know, I'd say we got 28 inches. Part of that 28 inches is on the other side of this, this dog. So this is when I finally get down to a square cant. That's the clamp that holds the cant. So from here out to the end of the guides is 24 inches. So the maximum clean board I can cut is 24 inches. So the maximum live edge I can cut is 28 inches. The maximum clean board is 24 inches. But not very often do I even cut 24 inch boards. Most of the time I cut dimensional lumber. Someone says they want a 
a stack of two by sixes and that's what I cut. So if I have a 24 inch wide cant, then I'll divide that into you know, say uh, four six inch cants and then I'll cut each of the six inch cants into two by sixes or one by sixes. And can you explain what a cant is real quick? A cant is the resulting log after you cut the four sides off. So it's you know without bark on any of the four sides and it's square. Just a big old hunk of big, flat big old edges. hunk of, of wood. Yeah. And from there you can either slice down through it or a number of other cutting techniques to get the products that you're looking for. Okay. Yeah, as you noticed when we pulled in, we were looking for a place that's reasonably level. Luckily enough, this is level side to side, but it's not level front to back. So what that required us to do, as you can see, the tongue of the trailer is pretty much sitting on the ground and the rear of the trailer is well up off the ground and I had to shim it up with two by fours. Each of these jacks that support the weight of the log when it's loaded needs to be below the bed rail. Otherwise my saw will hit the, the jack or it will keep the log or the cant from sitting flat on the rails. So if that's sticking up an inch above, then I can't get a, the log to sit flat. The more flat you can have, the better off we'll be. As you can see, in this case, we had to dig down about six inches to get these jacks below the surface of the mill. The problem that you run into is if we're cutting in a fine lawn, then it does mess up the lawn and we have to come back and repair it afterwards or the homeowner has to repair it afterwards. I'm using one and a quarter inch wide bandsaw blades. This is a four pitch blade. I use four pitch because I never know what I'm going to encounter. It's good for all hardwoods and in a lot of cases where something's been lying dead for a while, it gets really hard. So this is good for cutting any hard or frozen wood. There are many blade profiles that you could use instead, but I have chosen the four degree blade. I run the blade at about a 3000 PSI tension. That keeps the blade flat. This is also a 55 thousandths thick blade. Wood Miser sells a 42 thousandths thick blade. I use the thicker blade again to make sure that I get flat cuts and clean cuts. And as we go through the logs, when I start seeing wavy cuts, then I know it's time to change blades. I have a lubricator that drips water on the blade. It helps keep the blade clean and keep you know, pitch from building up on the blade. That's particularly important when you're cutting pine. The liquid that I use is a mixture of pine saw and water that helps cut the pitch. This device here is a debarker. We may not use that today, uh, but what this does is cut a tiny groove in the bark of the log exactly where the blade goes. So it cleans out any debris that might be in the bark. So in the case today where we're going to be dragging logs, that's going to uh, get dirt embedded into the bark of the wood. So this cleans out that dirt to extend the life of the blade. So moving on down the mill, this is the lift arms that's going to raise the log from the ground up to the bed of the mill and then we'll move it over to the side. Uh, getting it to this point is generally a manual process of using cant hooks and rolling the log. So the cleaner the log is, the better it rolls. So cut all the limbs off the log even with the log. Don't have any sticking out because it makes it difficult to roll. These are what's called tow boards. There's two, one at each end of the mill. This allows me to level a log. So normally when I am preparing to cut a log, I'll find where the center of the log is and I'll center the front and the rear at the same height using these rollers. So that's why it's important to have your logs at least eight feet long, otherwise they won't reach these rollers. The smallest log that I could mill is about 40 inches because it has to span these two rails plus hit these two clamps. So I can raise the 
the lift arms have a lifting capacity of about 4,000 pounds. So that could be a 16 foot pine log 30 inches in diameter. Anything bigger than that, the mill will not be able to lift. Once we raise the log up on the mill, I'll raise these arms. Maybe I should do that now, but these arms will be up and that'll be the backstop for the log. And this clamp here, this hydraulic clamp holds the logs against those uh, clamp backstop. This device is a claw that rotates the log. So one of the things I'll do is after uh, looking at the log up on the mill, I'll decide what the right opening cut will be and then I'll rotate the log to get it to that spot. And we'll talk more about that in the process as we get to some of these other logs. That's pretty cool. So we don't, we don't have to lift the log up there. We don't have to rotate. This thing just does it all. This does it all. But there are those cases where it, um, you get in trouble. If it's yeah. too big of a log, sometimes you have to rotate things manually to get them positioned right. Some fine tuning you might want to do to get cant square. And we'll, uh, we'll see all of that as we go through cutting these logs today. All right, well, let's, let's just get started on the first one then. All right. One of the first things I do is look at the log and see how I want to make the first cut. In this case, we have a big limb protruding here that's bigger than the rest of the log. So what I'll do is position this part of the log straight up and then I'll start by cutting that off. I keep track of all the logs that I cut. Yield of a log is driven by the narrow end. This one's 12 inches in diameter. So I'll record the diameter of the small end and the length of the log. And when I'm done, I'll calculate the square or the board footage that comes out of that log. That's 15 feet by 12 inches. So now I'll make the first cut. I'll come in about at 10 inches and make a cut. Then we'll see what the log looks like and then maybe we'll take another cut. The simple set allows me to define how thick cords I want to cut. So right now we want to do one inch boards. So recognizing that my saw blade has a one eighth inch curve, I'll set it for one and an eighth inch. Then we're ready to make the first cut. Yeah, that, you've got four good boards there. Yeah, I mean, 
four 15 foot boards you could get. So, so if we go through this, these are about six inches wide, two inches, so about one board foot per foot. Correct. Right? So a board foot is a one inch thick by, by 12 inch wide. By board. 12 inches long. By 12 inches long. So we got 15 board feet here. In each board. In each board, we got three boards. Now, how much does walnut go per board foot? Generally think? between 13 and $15 a board foot. So 13 times 15 equals 195 times three. So we're talking about almost $600 of lumber, not counting the other uh, black walnut we got out of here, just Correct. out of this one log. However, the $13 uh, dollars per board foot will be dried Dry. and planed on four sides. So you still have some work to do before you get to that quality. Right. But this, if Danner were to make his desk out of this, this is what would be beautiful wood. Yep. And it all came from a log that was sitting and going to rot in the forest. Correct. Become mushroom food. Yeah, like his, if he's building a desk that's six feet long, he's got two bo boards out of each one of these. So that would be, you know, uh, two, six a foot, three feet wide by six feet long desk, two inches thick. Now how how wide do you want your desk to be? I don't remember what it was now. Two feet wide. Oh, okay. So there it is. Three foot by six foot with some spare to cut wow. off. Perfect. And then you can build some shelves over it with that. Yep. So this is a cedar and it actually came from that tree right there that's still living. This is a branch that came off of it during the storm. So it's really cool that we were able to save this piece of wood and it's just so beautiful. All right, so we are three logs in now. We did a black walnut, a cherry, and a cedar. And I think it's looking really good. What do you think so I far? I think it's great. So a lot I'm, of good live edge product. Awesome. Yeah, I'm just so excited about that. And now we are heading on to our tulip poplar. This is the one that was over by the street and it was blocking uh, the power lines and just a huge tulip poplar. And we're gonna try to have some get some use out of it so we're hoping to do some board and batten siding with it so currently you know, the small ends about 16 inches well there's 18 by about 18 inches uh, the butt ends a little bit bigger but the productivity is going to be out of the small end so we should be able to get some one by 12s or i assume one one inch one by 12s out of the center and we'll cut some two inchers approaching that from all four sides and then we'll cut those two inchers into the battens to, that will go on the siding. So we should be able to get 12 siding boards plus some battens out of that. Okay. Do you think you can push it with your tractor? With the bucket or? Yeah, just with Thank you. 
right, so we just finished up with our pines. Uh, we made some big beams out of them, and these are going to be going underneath our uh, big beam that we made going from the living room to the kitchen on either side, and they just turned out awesome. The edges are, there's some parts that have some live edges, but that's just character, so that's what we're going to go with, and it's looking really good. But now we're moving on to our giant cherry tree that we cut down a few episodes ago, and we don't know what to expect with this one, but it has a hole at the bottom of it. Who knows what's gonna happen, but I'm really excited to see what it looks like. got a lot of wood today. Yeah, we got a lot of wood and I'm actually really surprised with how it all turned out. I just didn't expect it to be so nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you've got cedar, you've got cherry, you've got walnut, you've got poplar, you've got pine, a big selection of wood. <laughs> I think you've got a lot of wood to be able to continue your projects here. Yeah, and it also ended up being a lot of work carrying all that wood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it did and moving the logs and getting them up and up on the mill. So, as I have said, if it wasn't for the hydraulics, I wouldn't, wouldn't do this. <laughs> so, I appreciate the opportunity to come out and work with you, and I look forward to working with you again. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. We have been working on putting all this wood into a big stack where it can dry evenly, and it is a lot of work to move all this lumber. I'd say we've had to move everything in the stack like three times already, so it's definitely a, a tiring job, but we managed to get it all in a stack. We got this nice and level, and this is our first time ever doing a drying stack like this, so we don't really expect it to be perfect, but we do think it's gonna work for now. We're probably gonna end up using a lot of this wood to build a solar kiln, so that next time we cut wood, we'll be able to just put it in there. It'll be nice and flat and we'll just have everything dry faster and uh, more efficiently. Overall, we're just super happy with how everything turned out. It's just, it was just really cool to see that whole process of turning a log into usable lumber. So once again, a big shout out to Alan. Um, I'll go ahead and leave his website in the description. He has a bunch of information about sawmills and doing this yourself. But that's gonna be a wrap for this video. Thank you to everyone who has subscribed and liked the video. And also a huge shout out to everyone who backs us over on Patreon. We really appreciate your support and I will see you guys in the next video.